Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Bench Units. My name is Mark, as it usually is. I'm joined by James, as I usually am. How's it going, man? Uh, not too bad, thank you. How are you? Good Long time you. no speak. <laughs> and you may not have realized, but we actually have somebody sitting in on our call. We've got an intruder, otherwise <laughs> known as a guest. Um, this is the first in our series of preview- previewing the Euro Cup. And we're really excited to be joined by Jan Haller of Hanover United, or as we know him. Because that's a flex. How's Stop it going, giving Jan? his email address out online. <laughs> we'll edit that bit. How's it going, Jan? Hey, guys. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, no problem. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thanks for being here, man. Yeah, it's Thanks a real pleasure to have you. And we're really excited to talk to you because obviously... Um, we're wanting to get into the details of the Euro Cup and all that stuff. And you obviously know this as well as we do, but you guys have had a slightly um, unusual bump up with how the Euro Cup has shaken out this year in terms of going from what was meant to be the Euro League 3 qualifying round to now being the hosts of uh, Euro Cup 1, which is, I think that might be the fastest promotion I've ever seen. Um, so we're going to get into that in a little bit. But as your first time guest, we're going to hit you with the question we hit everybody with, which is, how did you get started in wheelchair basketball? Yeah, um, so I started wheelchair basketball when I was 12 years old. Um, I never really was interested in basketball. And uh, um, yeah, I was always about football, watching football. And yeah, then at some point, my uh, my my parents got divorced and I moved to uh, from Hanover to Bonn with my mom and my brother right. and um yeah so just to get to get started in a new town um my mom found a newspaper article about the Bonn Vichy basketball team which was pretty pretty good at that at that time uh, they were actually german champions uh, three times in a row like right. landero was not not uh, <laughs> not big at that time Back um, in the days yeah, and they also had a, a a youth team, and um, yeah, I went there for training, and I liked it, and but then I didn't go there for a couple of weeks because I was like, yeah, it was cool, but you know, I don't know if I really want to do that. And then I started to watch uh, after my training. I remember I started to watch a little basketball, a little bit of basketball, like uh, stand up basketball, yeah. and um, do you guys say stand up basketball by the way? Uh, uh, Running basketball. running basketball, able-bodied basketball, whatever you want to call it, yeah. No, no normal basketball. <laughs> normal is always a funny one. Uh, um, re- yeah, real basketball, and um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I like to, I, I really like to watch like uh, Dirk Nowitzki, for example. Yeah. Um, he was a big thing coming up. Like he was still young at that point, but he was in the NBA, and people started talking about him. And sure. uh, I watched, I think, a European basketball game uh, when he played for Germany. And I was really impressed and I was really into it. And like from watching basketball, I was getting more and more involved in, in wheelchair basketball. And uh, yeah, so I, I started to to go to training again. And um, this is how it started. Yeah. Nice. So That's cool. There's such a, there's such a common thing with so many people who start wheelchair basketball. And it's just like, yeah, my parents wanted me to go and meet some other kids or whatever. Like that's exactly the same as, me and Mark, I'm sure that was part of it for you as well. I think that's like a let's get the disabled kids into something. But it's amazing how many people that that's kind of like that's the common thread in our parents just wanting to get us involved in something. And look at us now, <laughs> Monday morning talking about it on a Zoom call. Look where we are. <laughs> yeah, look where <laughs> look at us. But yeah. Um. So from there, what was your first experience of like? higher level stuff did you move clubs or was it like under 22 german national team stuff or when was the first sort of oh i could be good at this moment because that's always interesting to me i think yeah um so i just started like i said started playing when i was 12 and i was just going to practice one time a week and doing a little bit of it and liking it more and more and then like i think two years later maybe when i was 14 15 um i was like yeah i want to play in a league but the bond team was obviously way too good for me <laughs> and uh, also their second team was way too good for me so i was looking for 
for an opportunity to play in a lower league and I went to a different club like no one would know about it now if I tell the name but the name was uh, TV Donrad like it's a uh, Ah yeah, that, uh, yeah, he rem- yeah. <laughs> Those guys, of course. Sorry. <laughs> uh, they played a regional league, which is like a, a third highest league. Um, but yeah, not really high quality. But I was, um, it was perfect for me to get started playing league basketball. And um, yeah, I think in my second season, I started to you know, like scoring really good and everything, and getting and better and that was the point where i first made it to a to a um, regional team like the best team of your region okay. like the, the like, like the best players of your region in germany we have that it's called a junior um, championship where you have like um the different um okay the different states yeah yeah we we and have for a, example um, yeah up to the age of like yeah. under 19 i think the um the cutoff mm-hmm. is where the, we do the regional championships but yeah it's i think quite yeah. i don't know how many countries do it but it's a really good model mm-hmm. yeah and there's also uh, always like one big championship once a year and for example i think when i was 16 or 17 uh, 17 i was like in, in my team i was playing for uh northern Ibis Fine, which is in the west and uh, i played together for example with uh, andre binek and we played against and a couple of other guys. Um, we played, for example, against against the Bavaria team, uh, which was full of guys like, like Tommy Böhme, who was 14 at that point, or uh, Sebastian Magenheim, um, Matthias Heimbach, you might know him. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, pretty good team. Like, there was a point where I was like, okay, now I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting better and better. And then at some point, I was making it to the under 22 national team, like the classic classic climb up i would say and then yeah what was your first under 22 tournament i only had one i was uh like from my age i was getting into the under 22 pretty old pretty late i would say so i only had one tournament the europeans 2008 in adana turkey Uh, okay yeah that was that was the the one where gb got disqualified right (laughs) Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> and we we didn't qualify for worlds either, so that was a shit tournament. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a um, couple of quick questions on the stuff we've just covered. You mentioned Bonn being three-time league champions um, in kind of the pre landil years. For the people who don't remember, who was on those Bonn teams that ran the German league for a while? Um, in that time, so. To be a little bit more detailed, they won the league 99, 2000, and 2001. Right. And I think in that time, uh, Bonn was run, uh, was, uh, I think the best players Bonn had were Martin Otto. Right. <laughs> He's, uh, you know him? Yeah, yeah, he was, I can't remember who he was coaching recently, but he was definitely coaching. Uh, the German woman, the German woman yeah. was coaching. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was uh, he was very dominating four and a half, sure. um, and uh, Guido Wimmers he's also very dominating four and a half, and uh, a couple of couple of other like Bonn was always like a, a German team like they never had any imports they never had money to pay players like they always had um, uh, a lot of German players like for example later guys like uh, Björn Lohmann yeah. like uh, Thomas Becker mm-hmm. um, me for example. Uh, we all went through Bonn. And, okay. Yeah, that can't, we're, we're that's not team quite player. true because I played against Bonn in my first Euro Cup ever and they had Adam Lance here and I don't think he was playing for free. But that yeah, was... The then, was then, then we were playing against each other. Was it in Austria? Uh, yes. Yeah. 2010 off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. We had Adam. Yeah. Okay. So so not yeah. not entirely low budget like you, like you initially said. Was Adam Lancia playing? I mean, he was our only import. We... <laughs> <laughs> I think he was. But, but to be honest. So it was probably money well spent. <laughs> but to be honest, Adam was uh, working 40 hours a week. Oh. Was, oh, right. Um, okay. He was working in Bonn, like, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Did he get a TV meal address mm-hmm. like you? or? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have one in Bonn. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I don't think that's, I think that's a recent <laughs> development. 
but I'm trying to yeah. think what I'm trying to think what the equivalent would be in like the early 2000s because I don't think anyone had a like a company email address at that point. Pager. Like, <laughs> yeah, <a> pager. <laughs> right. Oh God. Can we shift on a little bit. Sure. Cool. So you mentioned Landil uh, just now, Jan, and obviously you spent a good um, number of years there. Do you want to tell us, obviously we've had Yannick and Tommy on recently who are kind of telling us what sets Landil apart from the other clubs in the world in terms of being a very professional outfit. Do you want to tell us, compared to the teams you've just described and your current setup in Hanover, what stands out about your Landil years for you? What stands out for me, I would say the first thing comes to my mind is home games, like uh, playing. Like when I was in Bonn, I played four years uh, in the first division with Bonn. Uh, we always got our asses kicked by Landil, but uh, I remember like for me, it was always a highlight to play uh, Landil away yeah. because there was always so many fans in there and the setup was so cool. And um, so when I signed for Landil, it was uh, very special for me. And I was like, I spent seven years there and still to my last home game i was uh looking forward to every home game we had because it's just quite special to in our sport to have to to play in front of 800 to 1500 fans uh, every two weeks yeah. and uh, this is really something that stands out to me and also like the fans really understood basketball it was not weecher basketball and was not like yeah they brought in a lot of classes every two weeks and uh well, some guys that just wanted to yeah see the sport and never come back they were really fans right. like for example when we played in frankfurt which is only like a 40 minute drive there were like 300 Lando fans showing up right. uh, and maybe like 150 fans from frankfurt and it was like a home game the whole gym was full of Lando fans or when we played in uh, champions cup 2012 in istanbul there were 50 50 fans flying over to istanbul which is a lot for, for wheelchair basketball. Yeah, that's and, amazing. Um, yeah, so for me, really what stands out are the fans and the whole like the whole atmosphere. Um, but overall, like I said, London was a, a pretty cool time for me. Um, I really enjoyed playing there. Um, when I left, it was time to go. Like it was a good, yeah, it was a good, um, how can I say it? Yeah, it, it felt like it was time to go. Sure. So, um, I feel like I left on a good note. Like uh, always, I still have good relationship with a lot of guys there, uh, with the management, with the, some players there still. And um, yeah, it's just uh, just has been a great time there, playing with so many, so many great players. Um, yeah, winning so many titles. It was really cool. Yeah, that's cool, man. Something I always like to ask people who've been at one club with so many good players for such a long time is like who sticks out obviously you could name a list of players that were absolutely unbelievable world class but if you had to pick a handful of guys over your over your time there that really stuck out as the best players you played with who would you who would you go for um i mean obviously steve serial like he's uh <laughs> what impressed me with him um is that it always looked so easy what he did like he made so many crazy things. Um, yeah, I mean, he's one of the best players in the world, but he made it look so easy. And um, yeah, then I would say Mikey Pay, the way he lead the team, the way like I learned so much from him, from um, from leading, or about leading and about um, being a team player and about always putting the team first. Um, yeah, I love playing with Mikey. Like we're still in contact. We text like every couple of weeks, and he's asking how it's going, oh, and uh, he still follows everything. Like he's an um, an amazing guy. Um, also, like I only got to spend one year with him, but like my first year with uh, Joey Johnson. Um, yeah. I mean, that was <laughs> obviously a, a, a big pleasure for me to to have his last Landell season and experience that. Um, yeah, just just the way how he defended and uh, how important he was for his team when he only scored four points. Yeah, uh, how he was there in the Champions Cup final against Istanbul. Like, I think he had like a, I think he averaged like eight points a season in uh, in that season, and then in the final he 
he scored 20. Like, that's just, amazing. Yeah, because yeah, just because he wanted to win another Champions Cup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I think those three guys, but also like, yeah, those were great players. But also like the friendship I have now with Tommy Böhme, for example, or with Christopher Huber, Annabel Breuer. Um, yeah, this is something uh, that will stay forever. And this is something I have because I played for that team, and yeah. Uh, I guess one one question. I don't know if we asked this to Tommy or to Yannick when they were were on with us, but Landil is obviously year after year a lot of superstar players and a lot of egos because um, you have the best players in the world gathering kind of a, in one squad. In your years there, do you ever find were the guys who came who found it tough to fit in and tough to kind of establish their role or do you think the culture of the team is good enough that everybody kind of finds their slot? Uh, I really have to think about it. Um, I think in my time where I've been there, we always said uh, most of the time, like seven, eight, nine players, they were always been around yeah. and they always had the, I don't know, maybe, yeah, they always, knew about the team culture and everyone who came in was already adapting and so i would say i can't think about someone who didn't fit in or who who was struggling and left after one year right like i think the i think some problems that come up with a team like that like when you when you have like a starting five like in a couple of, like we had a starting five was, for example, Dirk Köhler, uh, Sirio, Pei, Böhme, and Björn Lohmann. And then yeah, you have five. also like, yeah, that's a, that's a good starting five. Um, but you have also like five German national team players on the bench yeah. that also wants to prepare for like uh, major tournaments with the national team. Then it's obvious that you have some, yeah, some uh, some people that are not so, um, not so happy. Sure. And yeah, so over the years, like me personally, I had times where, where I didn't play a lot, and I had times where I played a lot. And that happens also to guys like Nico Dreimüller, to Chris Huber, like um, national team players for years now. But yeah, I think I really can't remember a guy who didn't fit in and and left right away. Like, yeah, that time I've been there. Like, that's really kind, of, kind of amazing to hear because we've obviously watch a lot of games week in week out and we kind of I think between me and James we feel like we have the lowdown on a lot of these teams because we've watched them so much and you even see teams like for example let's say Malaga in the Spanish league who have kind of 10 competent basketball players and to the point where they struggle to make their rotations always that efficient and they sometimes go with the wrong lineup or whatever or you've seen guys come in and out of Malaga in a year because they're kind of stacked up on mid-level talent, but no obvious hierarchy. And I always find it fascinating that a relatively mid-tier team like that can struggle with those problems. Then you can have an array of world-class talent at a team like Landil, and they just don't suffer from any of those issues. It feels like they they should be the team where everyone's kind of arguing over minutes rather than... Um, you know, not to criticize anybody at Malaga or say they're not good players in their own right, but if Landil can make it work, I feel like everybody should be able to. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think what Landil made good, um, like when you when you sign for them, you know, you know why you do it. Like you're not going there and you're like, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a normal club. Like I play for, like I get my money and yeah, if I don't train good for two weeks, like I don't like doesn't really matter because there you have to you have to show up every day and you have to be your best version every day. And also with all those fans and you see them traveling to away games, you see them spending a lot of money on on buying jerseys and on buying tickets and everything. Like you get a feel for it that like you 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 see the reason why you do it every day. Okay. Yeah. Like as an athlete, you're like you're always drive yourself to be the best version but you also when you play for that club you also see why you do it and i think this is something um something special about that club that not every club has so okay. yeah i think that maybe makes, that's the reason yeah 
Yeah, I think that makes sense in terms of, obviously, as you say, a lot of what athletes do is you put work in every day because you want to make yourself better. But if you have that external factor of this club puts a lot into me and these fans put a lot of support into me and even the history of the club, like you don't want to be part of like, you know, you look back at Landill in 20 years, you're like, oh, remember those three years where they were really weird and didn't win it? Like, I think that probably is something to do with it as well, for sure. But I think it says a lot about the culture of a team that you go there and just how it's run from top to bottom and the sort of environment around it, including the fans, makes athletes want to perform and want to work hard. I think that's that's a pretty special formula. Yeah, definitely. Shall we move on a little bit because we'll get these last couple of topics out of the way and then we'll get to the Euro Cup juice. Yeah, we'll get down, we'll get down into the Euro League stuff. But just before that, I think it would be weird to get on here and not talk to you, uh, you about Tokyo. So, yeah, bit of a bit of a strange tournament for everyone involved. Obviously, no fans postponed for a year. Just very generally, how was your Tokyo experience before we get more specific? Mm. And when I think about it, I think about it more positive than I thought after after we lost to Spain in the quarterfinals. Sure. Um, now it's. With some months, uh, like with some time, <laughs> some time later, I'm thinking about it like really in a positive way because um, I think, yeah, we didn't play a bad tournament, and we nearly beat the USA in the first game. We beat the World Championship in our second game. Um, then we play a good quarterfinal against Spain, but we lose somehow, and uh, yeah, and it. The same thing happened, what happened to us in Rio 2016, where we lost to Spain as well, with four points. Yeah. Um, you, tried the, you tried the chairman so, stuff again, for some reason? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, that wasn't in Rio, obviously, but that, that's happened before. But came out the gates really strong. Obviously, you beat us, nearly beat the USA. You came out shooting the ball really well, shooting a pile of threes every game. I remember being like, oh, Germany. Germany could be causing someone some trouble. But do you think Spain was just a bad crossover? Like, do you feel like you could have picked another team from that other group? And Yeah, so it was about Spain or Japan. And so when we found out that we had to play Spain, I was kind of like, because after the pool game and we saw every game, um, and I was like, oh, maybe Spain is a better one than Japan at home. Oh, yeah. Like, um, and I still think that way because I think we knew Spain. We played them a lot in the summer, like three times, I think, in the preparation. Um, so we knew a lot about them. And um, it's nothing special what they what they play. Like they give Asia Garcia the ball and uh everything else works out and they go inside yeah but james knows game, this we... place for bilbao i was gonna say I, yeah I, I know how that yeah everyone knows how and that works they're just and their whole pretty... thing is i guess this is what we put on the floor and it's quite hard to stop because we're all giants like <laughs> i mean it worked out pretty well for them like it was successful in rio it was successful uh also in in tokyo i think yeah um, i mean they beat us and um but for me, it was like when the game was over, I still thought like, damn it, like we we could have won that game. But yeah, I mean, on that level, it's just sometimes like it doesn't work out so well. And um, I would say, I would say if we play them again, like we played them again in Madrid and we beat them by, by 20. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It wasn't on a big stage like in Tokyo, but it's felt good after that <laughs> to show them that we're a little bit better than we, we we were in that quarterfinal but yeah it still hurts to be honest because um it was my third for me personally it was my third Paralympics and third time I got kicked out in a quarterfinal and especially in Tokyo we went into that tournament with the mindset of winning a medal and with uh like we we knew we were good like we knew we can compete with anyone in the world and I think that's what we showed against USA, what we showed against GB, um, what we also showed against Spain. But yeah, it 
was just the quarterfinal at the Paralympics again. <laughs> I think um, it's interesting the, what you say about going in there with the intention of winning a medal because I think Germany might have had over the last couple of tournaments some of the worst luck in kind of how that's fallen because, like you say, you guys looked absolutely top tier competitive to start in Tokyo and you'd beaten GB. So there was a case to be made that had you beaten Spain in the quarterfinal, there was no reason to count you out in the bronze medal game against GB. And then moving on to the Europeans last year, you um, lost to the eventual European champion Netherlands without, um, because Tommy missed your semi-final, right? I think there's, again, every case to be made that you could have won that game. Uh, And you ended up, not even playing for the bronze medal, right? So you, you could have had a European bronze off the, um, the back of that because I think anyone would be out of their mind to argue that Italy might have beaten you. <laughs> yeah. Unless they had a shooting game like Cantu did the other weekend, in which case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right about that. Um, this is also something what hurt us in Madrid because we were feeling like, okay, um, that that we could have won that game against Netherlands even without Tommy. Like, we were up by 12. And, like, we just lost the, the, the last quarter by, I don't know, can't remember so much, but I think we only scored, like, six points or something, or eight, or okay. not even, I think. Maybe only five. I don't know. <laughs> we were bad. Um, but we still had a chance to to beat them without Tommy and then have Tommy back for a final. Yeah. Like, that would have been interesting to see, to play GB. Um, yeah, but it wasn't, so... <laughs> it wasn't to be. That's, yeah, yeah. that's how sport Congrats. goes, apparently. Yeah. Congrats to the Netherlands. <laughs> that's, how, that's how sports goes, especially in COVID times. Yeah, we've um, we've quite a number of Dutch listeners, and we uh, we love to get our digs in about that uh, that European gold of theirs. <laughs> we'll, we'll get a text from Mendel in like a couple of days' time when he listens to this and is like, don't, don't be talking trash about our gold medal. Um, but we... Yeah, I mean, we'll transition here a little bit because we we weren't initially going to ask you about this, but we've had a couple of questions in from our listeners around this area. And this is probably a good way to link from German national team to your current role in Hanover. Um, obviously, going back a year plus now, there was the whole Hanover divorce from Joe Beswick, who is now your national team teammate uh, with the German national team having gotten his citizenship and everything. So we, well, a couple of our listeners kind of wanted to know what's the dynamic like in that sense, obviously by the sounds of it, not the most pleasant separation from Hanover. And then obviously you guys are professionals and you know that you're going there to achieve a goal. How is it kind of trying to reestablish, you know, that guy as your teammate in a new context, I guess. For me personally, it wasn't hard. I mean, I don't know how it was for him. I bet it was not easy. Um, I mean, it was also not easy for for me, but it wasn't also hard. Like it was, it felt kind of normal to see him back with the national team because I mean, I spent a lot of time with him in Landil, um, spent a lot of time with him in Hanover and yeah. Um, the way it ended was uh, not cool for both sides and um, yeah I already knew that there's a possibility that we see each other again in the summer and for me it was all good like um, I think we moved on from it he moved on from it Um, me and like other teammates from from Hanover United moved on from it and I mean it was a special situation because you feel like you go on to that first um you go into that first camp with the national team and everyone from like players from other teams are like, Oh, how is this going now? And you feel like a little bit watched. <laughs> like, how are these guys going away, going along together? And um, yeah, but it worked out pretty good, I would say. So yeah. no hard feelings from my side. Um, awesome. Just straight, yeah. straight back to business. I guess that's what the, be- yeah. the best way it could go. I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wouldn't want to, uh, wouldn't like to have it any other way because um, anything else wouldn't wouldn't have been cool. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. Awesome. 
Right. Sure. Mark, you asked that question in a very in a very professional manner because the questions we got were a bit more like, what's the, what's happening there? <laughs> so well done. <laughs> well done to both of you. We've um we've covered that question off in the most non-confrontational way we can manage. <laughs> uh but yeah i'm glad you answered that so professionally and because that could have gone bad quickly yeah because i think there is a thing where people are like oh i'm really interested in this as like gossip or whatever but it's like it's people's lives and people's jobs and having to move from city to city and stuff so it's not like it's it's not actually that fun to, to yeah. for people like people are interested in it as a very detached thing but it's it's all people like yeah. so i always thought that was a bit strange but yeah, people want to know. I guess that's what we're here for, apparently. <laughs> Breaking news. Um, we're never going to turn into a wheelchair basketball rumor mill. That's not what we do. But you say you say that. We've got another question coming up later that's some uh, rumor mill material. So maybe don't, maybe don't make that um, assumption too early. I, w- I would say this is a tease, but by this point, anyone listening, it already counts as a listen for the podcast. So, you know, <laughs> tune in later or don't. I don't care. <laughs> Right. Um, <laughs> okay. Should we move on to some Euro Cup stuff? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So as Mark said earlier, you guys are hosting Euro League One now. <laughs> um, how does that come about in such a straight like that? That was that was a weird one to me because you went from Euro League Three qualifiers to hosting one, right? Isn't that what you said? Yeah. Mm, oh. It's not hundred percent true. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Uh, first of we'll all, edit it out. I, we're never wrong. Sorry. <laughs> first, first of all, I stopped. Uh, I stopped questioning uh, decisions from IWBF. <laughs> <after> <laughs> <years ago. laughs> yeah. So, I... um, yeah. No. Uh, but Euroleague three qualifiers was the plan for 2020 when uh, COVID started. Uh, so okay. um, to to start a little bit earlier, like Hanover United never made a. Made an, uh, never made a Euroleague appearance uh, in the history of the club so far. So we had to go through that one qualifying tournament to start collecting points for that system, for that ranking. Um, that got cancelled because of COVID. Yeah. And then last year, we wanted to do the same thing. It got cancelled because of COVID. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, then we decided to to apply for a Euroleague tournament for the for this season. And they gave us the Euroleague 2. Right. Okay. Um, host, host, I think it was, a, I think we were about to host the Euroleague 2 in, no, no, in March, yeah. in March. Yeah. And um, then they canceled that because of COVID. And then they were asking teams like, hey, who would still be in? Like, who would like to, who would like to um, host, who would like to be in. And uh, yeah, that's what we said. Like we said, we would like to be in and we would also still like to host. Like we have the, we have the possibility to do it this year. Like why not, why not doing it? And then suddenly we got the message that we're about to host your league one. So I don't know why, but <laughs> I mean, we take it. <laughs> so um, like I said, don't question it too much and uh, take it. And we're really looking forward to it. Like um, also playing, um, playing Gran Canaria as the first um, European game in the history of the club is pretty big for us. Yeah. And yeah, we're really looking forward to it. Awesome. That's cool, man. I One of the things that has been interesting over the last couple of years of cancelled tournaments and, you know, postponed Euro leagues and everything is they've taken out the qualifying rounds, which is great for me because I don't understand them anyway. So <laughs> I would have had to come on here in March and speak about it and be like, so if this team beats this team, they might go to Euroleague two finals. So it's kind of it's been clarifying in that way. So that's been nice. But yeah, so you have Gran Canaria game one. Awesome. That's a yeah. big game. That's that's the final in my that, mind. Yeah, that, I was going to say that before we came on here. That's the final of the tournament, unless anything goes really sideways. Um, yeah, I think like we got the toughest team to play, and but I also think uh, that they got the toughest team to play against. Um, I, sure. I hope so. <laughs> um, and yeah, for us, uh, we now have uh, first of all we have to play Landil um, in the in the playoffs semifinals. Um, 
and then we're going to focus on on Gran Canaria. But you can see it with the team already. Like everyone's talking a little bit about Gran Canaria and training. Everyone's like, "Hey, have you seen them play?" Like, well, um, we'll, we'll let you in on the secrets. They run one offense every time they have the ball. So <laughs> all you have to well, do. They have a little bit more diversity now. But the thing is. Then this is kind of going to lead into a question I wanted to ask. So they obviously, as with every Spanish team, kind of have this thing going into EuroLeague where they have the junior point reduction, which they then don't have when it comes to EuroLeague, which means they play one lineup in the league and then they have to come and play in a tournament and change it. The thing I was going to mention was the fact that they ran their EuroLeague lineup for five minutes and 44 seconds on Saturday and then subbed because they needed to win a game. <laughs> um, whereas you guys presumably have been running the lineups that you're going to roll out in EuroLeague all season. So how much of an advantage do you think that is, like not having the junior point reduction all season so you're used to playing actual 14 and a half points? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it can be an advantage because... Um, they may be not so used to that lineup, but I also think that they they have a hell of a team. Like they have a really good team. They um, I remember like on that team. Uh, like I watched them a lot, and I really liked how you guys were playing. Like moving the ball, um, playing playing as a team uh, so well, and it was really um, a joy to watch. To be honest, like I really watched you guys the most from the Spanish league, and. Um, this is why why I'm looking forward so much to to see how we compete against a team like that. So sure. maybe if we wouldn't have them in the quarterfinal, um, we we wouldn't face them. Sure. Um, uh, you never know. And now we have that first game against them. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I want to see how... Um, I, I find it very interesting to see how the third best team in Germany is... Um, against uh, like a, I think they are third place at the moment, right? Yeah, they are. They are. Yeah. They are. They are Second or third, but yeah, but let's say they're third. Like, uh, I want to see how how the third best German team is competing against the third best Spanish team, even though they can't play their lineup. Um, yeah. But I, I, yeah, I really like that we play against them. Yeah. To be fair, I'd say about them not being able to play their lineup that happened all last year, and then. Uh, Grand Canaria we went to Champions Cup last year and they put their one pointer in for their two pointer me um, and only lost to Landil by two I think so like it's not like those guys are still able to get it done at a pretty high level um, obviously Mendel was there and isn't but like it's slightly different in that way but yeah like they're no like that that change doesn't take away the fact that they're absolutely loaded with talent still yeah. for sure so, uh, yeah, and just in terms of, you mentioned this is kind of Hanover's first European tournament, and obviously your team's got a decent mix of guys, but you do have a lot of younger players. Um, I was say a lot of people called Jan. I was well, dying we, for you to say that. You do, you do have a lot of people called Jan. That is also true. We, we need to get into how that works in your timeouts at some point, but... Um, yeah, as kind of a veteran who's obviously been there and done it with Landale and, you know, all that other stuff over the years, what are you do? What do you tell your young guys in terms of how to prepare for a, a Euro Cup and kind of the, I feel like the, the important thing I always thought with a Euro Cup was to never get too high and too low, you know, following a win or a loss. Do you have any advice you give your guys who are coming up in kind of that? amount of basketball in mm. such a short amount of time? Not really, to be honest, because uh, you're right. We have a couple of young guys in our team that never played Euro Cup before, but most of them already played like a European Championship or even Paralympics, yeah. which is much bigger than a EuroLeague game. Um, so I don't think I really have to give them uh, much of advice, to be honest. Um, I think it will be special. I think we will have a lot of I hope we will have a lot of spectators in the gym. Um, it will be a Friday night game. It will be will be really cool atmosphere. And um, we play a great team. So I think we should enjoy it. And we should just um, 
feel the I don't know how to say it. <laughs> feel the like it's special to have a knockout game. Like you normally in the playoffs now you have a best of three. Or in a league, like you miss one game, but yeah, okay, you win the next one. But a knockout game is pretty special. And this is something that we maybe I don't know, maybe have a little advantage against uh Gran Canaria because I would say they are the favorites, but in one game anything can happen. And this is maybe something I would tell those guys, like, hey, let's put everything in. Let's see how it works. And if we win it, like, we have a, maybe a really good chance. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, sorry. For... No, on you go. Um, as the, I don't, well, forgive me if this is already out there. I haven't seen it yet. Have the, like, have the brackets been put out? Like, if you win your first game, do you know who you're, like, who you're playing, who you might cross over with into the final? Because that's something I'd be interested in, like, after... I know you're probably thinking one game at a time, but after that, if you beat Gran Canaria, who who else is on your radar? I saw it last week, <laughs> but I forgot already. Like I've, I didn't, I don't even know how the other uh, who the other teams are playing. To be honest, like cool. um, no problem. Yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's cool. It's that's something that we should have, but I also don't know this. I don't know if it's something that. He's out in public yet. I, I'm sure it is somewhere. The IWDF um, is sometimes sometimes their media is unclear. <laughs> it um, might be me. Yeah, I, no, I think that's a fair point. Um, my other question was going to be uh, if we list off the groups real quick. So it's obviously yourselves, Hanover as host, Gran Canaria, Porto Torres, um, who could actually be a dark horse. They've got probably more talent than most people have seen because nobody watches Italy anymore, I don't think. Uh, Ramat Gan. Torres do always have high-end talent, don't they? Yeah. Um, sitting Bulls, so that's good for you to be prepped for that because they're basically the same team as when we played in Austria like 10 plus years ago. <laughs> um, Halakam Haifa, also from Israel. Pilatus Dragons, most of the Swiss men's team who are also the same as they've been for the last 10 years. And Toulouse from France. So, it's a bit of a mix. How do you guys go about kind of, you've said you're going to get past Landil and start prepping for Gran Canaria. Do you make an effort to kind of watch the other teams or dig up video where you can, or do you approach it with the kind of, we'll just handle our own business. And because everybody at the tournament watches the other teams as they're playing, right? Yeah, I think for us, it's pretty clear. So I think every game will be online. So, um, however the game against Gran Canaria ends, like if we win, we will prepare for for our next game. Um, same thing as when we lose. And all the games, like we have the last game of that day, of that first day. So, I think we'll probably have um, uh, video footage of the other games. And then we will, uh, we will prepare on Saturday morning or even Friday night for the next game. But uh, yeah, I think our coach will find a way. <laughs> Just in time preparation is the uh, the Euro Cup model. Is <laughs> it's like yeah, I always yeah. think it's very interesting that you have your like you have a week to prepare and do video for your quarterfinal, and then like twelve hours to do something for a semifinal or a final. Which obviously the thing is trying to spread it out, but you can you can't really dedicate real time to prepping for every team. So it's kind of like if it was very clear who would end up in a final, hypothetically, you could do that. But I don't think it is. So that kind of that's it's such a strange thing in wheelchair basketball, like that most of what we do is like games are a week apart or like you have those you have the three game series in the finals and then your league is just like prepare really hard for your semifinal and then maybe watch some YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe like with when i played with in landil still um and we had like the quarterfinal so we were preparing for all three opponents in one week maybe like we watched video tuesday of that one team wednesday of the other team thursday on the other team and then we saw all three teams and then the close of the first game came we focused more on that on that first team we were played and uh, we were playing and yeah yeah so Mind you, Landil probably have enough staff and enough funding that they just like put somebody on a flight to every other team's games, right? 
They're just like, you, you can fly to France and watch this team this weekend. You can fly to Israel and watch these two teams play each other. I don't know if they ever did yeah. that. It feels like something. <laughs> uh, I never heard of that, but it's probably possible. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess last, last question on Euro Cup from me is, we obviously had Mariska on here a couple of months ago when she was uh, in kind of early recovery from COVID. Uh, from what I understand, she's back training to some extent, not yet back to playing. That's obviously a pretty big impact on you guys with obviously Mariska playing with the points deduction and playing as a 2.5. Uh, so how has that kind of impacted the second half of your season and how do you see it impacting your Euro Cup standing? Um, I'm not so sure if she's back, to be honest. Yeah, okay. um, I'm going through um, little bits of evidence from Instagram where she's posted like a picture <laughs> of her chair or a ball in her hand. So maybe I'm... Yeah, maybe- she was she was having light training. She was having light training with us, but... Um, she was not able to go five on five or something. Right. Yeah. Hard to hear that. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. But this is something she has to, maybe she has to be on the podcast again to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> like, but yeah, I think she's on a good way and it was great to have her with us uh, in the last couple of weeks. It was nice to have her, nice to see her again. And for sure in the tubing game, uh, she was on the bench. Uh, as our coach had COVID, uh, she was coaching us a little bit, right? Okay. Bringing, bring, bringing in her experience, and that was great. Um, and I really look forward to to have her back playing with us whenever that is. Yeah. Cool, man. Awesome. All right. Should we hit questions? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So we have uh, we had a couple of questions about stuff that we've kind of worked in um, throughout the podcast. So if you don't hear your name, it's because it's already been. It's already been addressed. Um, we have a question from Rose Hollerman uh, that just says, and maybe you'll be able to tell us what this is about. She says, where's the real Jan at? <laughs> <laughs> the real Jan at? No idea what she means. To be honest. No. Maybe she means Jan Zadler. I don't yeah. know. We're, we'll, get, we'll get into this now, actually. How do your guys' timeouts work when you have three guys called Jan? Because it must be a nightmare. Uh, we had the same situation uh, the World Cup 2018 and then Tenerife 2017 in the <laughs> Europeans because Jan Gans and Jan Zadler were also on the team like me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the funny thing is no one gets called Jan. It's like, <laughs> like we, uh, just all surnames? Uh, yeah, Jan Zadler. Got, I never call him Jan. I always call him Stapler. Like his nickname in Hannover and uh, in the national team. Um, Jan Gans is always called Goose. Oh yeah, because yeah, Gans is goose in German. <laughs> sure. So, and I and everyone just calls me Hala, so it's not a big problem. Right. <laughs> the, it, so the, there's the, no real uh, Jan. <laughs> the other thing we were going to ask is: Does Oliver Jans, who plays for Hanover, count as an official Jan because it's the first three letters of his surname? <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I think there's something very funny and obviously there are ways around it by using second names or numbers or whatever, but like running a three-man action with three people with the same name to see if a team is like, I'm just going to blow this communication and give you guys a layup. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, anyway, that was just purely for me and Mark. This yeah. was not for you or for anyone listening. We just needed to ask these questions. Okay, so the next question we have coming in is from Tom Smith, and it is, what do you have planned for the summer? Um, Not much so far. Um, So what I have planned for the summer, like after the season, um, going on holidays with my girlfriend and our dog, (laughs) we go to uh, make a road trip through Scotland. Oh, Um, nice. (laughs) Niche. Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> where where um, are you going? I um, have to ask. Um, like the whole round trip, like oh, I would right. say, like we go, we, we like Edinburgh, um, other towns, <laughs> and then through the Highlands awesome. and uh, Glasgow. Yeah. yeah, your English has been great. On mostly, this mostly in the Highlands. 
your, your English has been up to the challenge of this podcast so far, but I would very much like to hear from you how you manage with the accent when you go to places like Aberdeen and Glasgow. Because if, if you can understand them, you, you're you like an official English or Scottish speaker. <laughs> I, I, or, uh, I already have been in uh, Glasgow oh, really? and also in Edinburgh. And um, yeah, it was it was not easy to understand. But after days, I'm getting used to it a little bit more. <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah. And other than that, we have a national team camp uh, coming up uh, in the summer. Uh, I think we're going to Australia. Um, oh. looks like it and uh, yeah so but other than that it looks like a kind of free summer for, for oh, us nice. so. wicked uh, it's the first um, I think this is a weird year isn't it because it's everybody's first free summer who's like an, a consistent international player apart from a couple of years ago when it was COVID and nobody could do anything with any of their free time so it's like you've had that gifted back to you this year I guess yeah yeah, I think it's pretty important because also like when the season starts, you're going straight to World Cup. And um, so you need some time to get your head out of basketball and also um, give your body a little bit of rest. So yeah, I don't good... think I don't think the summer off two years ago counts when it was like, hey, you have two months off. Stay inside and fear for your life. <laughs> like that doesn't, That's not a holiday. <laughs> For anyone, no, and if it is, I'd count. like to. I'd like to know how. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, what have we got next, Mark? So this is from Tom Smith as well, who said, "Are you looking to strengthen the Hanover squad for next season?" Rumor has it there are two Australian three pointers that need a club. I don't know if you've heard this rumor from a very credible news source. I would like to add their names aren't Jans, so they're going to have to. <laughs> they're going to have to pass a test. Yeah. No. No chance if they don't have if, if the name is not Jan, they have no chance. Um, yeah, if their name isn't Jan, they're not getting an email address at least. <laughs> yeah. And if they are Australian, the name is probably not Jan, so I'm sorry. Oh, the, there's there's Yannick, right? That's close. He's obviously not looking to ju- to he, he he would he would count, but okay. I don't think he would come. <laughs> um yeah, it's not my job. Like um that's something you have to ask our coach and our management. Sure. Um, I think they're always looking to strengthen our team. Um, so, yeah, let's see what happens, I would say. Cool. cool. And the <laughs> last question from, once again, Tom Smith is, do you think the German national team has a chance for a medal in Dubai? I think we always have a chance. Um, depends on how we... Um, I would now say how we get our shit together, but <laughs> um, I think we always had a chance in the last years um, to have a medal in big tournaments, but we somehow had games where we just didn't perform. And this has to get better. Like in games, they matter. Like games that matters, um, we have to be we have to be more ready. Or I would say like maybe have a little bit more luck. Or I don't know. Like it's just we just have to win more big games, I would say, and then we have a chance. But to be honest, it's so so far away from, uh, for, from me now, and you don't know how the roster looks, how the other teams look. Yeah. Everyone stays healthy, hopefully, but yeah, you don't really... Yeah, for me, it's so far away. I think as a German national team, we always have a chance, but especially in the men's competition, there's so many teams that can win a World Cup medal. Yeah, well, yeah. sure. The good news for you guys is Spain won't be at this World Cup, so there's no chance of running into them in the quarterfinals this time. Yeah, that's pretty good news for us, yeah. <laughs> All right, you can enjoy Scotland in peace. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, I think that's everything. Yeah, that's everything we've got. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for joining us, man. And we wish you all the best at the uh, Euro Cup finals. And yeah, obviously... James will be rooting for Gran Canaria, but I'll root will for you to balance Yeah, it. maybe. Probably. Yeah, thanks, guys. It was a pleasure to be on. And uh, yeah, good luck for your podcast. Cool. Thank thanks, you, man. man. Appreciate next, it. In the next years. <laughs> yeah, welcome back anytime. And for everyone listening, uh, this has been Jan Heller. Um, thank you very much. Yep. See you Peace next time. Everybody.